Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you, wherever you are. Um, I'm Martin Shaw, I chair the Human Element Working Group, um, and um, I will be the, the host for this uh, webinar today. Um, as many of you may know, the Human Element Working Group and IMRS have been heavily involved with an organisation called the Human Element Industry Group, uh, and the Human Element Industry Group are looking at um, enclosed space deaths, which are one of the most uh, one of the most prolific cause, causes of occupational deaths in the in the marine industry. Um, one of the issues that we have with um, with, with the um, enclosed species is is the lack of understanding that many people have um, of, of of the risks and and um, the, the, the problems of of toxic vapor and, and so forth. Um, as uh, Katrina has said just before I introduce uh, our speaker, as Katrina has said. Um, Slido is there. Make use of it. <clears throat> also make use of the votes because if you if you vote, it gives me a hint as to which um, uh, which you're actually interested in uh, in me reading out. Um, without further ado, then I'd like to introduce Donald Burke. Uh, Donald was uh, um, started in the shipping industry in the merchant marine with Irish shipping, going from engineer cadet to uh, chief engineer, um, and and finally holding a, a first class combined certificate of competency. Prior to that, uh, prior to that, uh, uh, sorry, after that, he entered the teaching, um, first of all, on the marine engineering in Cork, um, and then subsequently became the head of nautical studies at the department. Um, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm mixing myself up here. Subsequently <laughs> became head of the National Mar Maritime College um, of Ireland. He retired in 2006 and became a consultant in marine engineering and was involved in the, the building of the Angola Maritime College. Uh, he's also been the secretary of the Stena Association of Marine Institutes um, and is currently involved in research into oxygen depletion. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass you across to Donald. Over to you, Donald. Thank you, Martin, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I sincerely hope that I will make your time well spent today uh, in that. As a result of all of that, I just want to introduce it this way. Entering into enclosed spaces and the speed of oxygen depletion and raising the awareness. This is really what I want to try and get across. This is an association with the City of Glasgow College. I've been involved with those for, for quite, a, quite a while. So just moving on then, and he asked the question, why do people die in enclosed spaces? And is it because the space looks normal or is it the fact that the cargo is an everyday commodity? Sometimes you find these at, at, in the home and in, at work and you sort of say, nothing can be, can be a problem with those. But if you look at, at, at a typical bulk carrier outline and you see the number of spaces that are involved here, and I suppose with the exception of the accommodation and the engine room spaces, which are reasonably well ventilated, all other spaces can be considered as enclosed spaces at some, at some stage. You look at the midship section and again you can see quite a few spaces there pipe tunnels which should be ventilated but you're never sure about these and then the bow section and the bow section is a peculiar conglomeration of of, of meetings effectively of the cargo hold you kind of a, a ladder going down or a, a, a tunnel going down to meet the the uh, pipe tunnels you have the chain locker you have the forehead uh, the forecastle area could have storage areas so you have a huge meeting of places there for danger to occur. And just to give you a few examples. In the Viking Isle, uh, it was a chain locker scenario. Three people died. It was a standby vessel off the UK coast, and there were basically two people who went down to tie off a rattling anchor chain. Unfortunately, uh, they died, and the person who went to rescue them took off his mask, and he, he died. Then the Sava Lake, which was a very interesting case. It was a space adjacent to a steel cargo where two died. And basically, there was a ventilation trunking in the storeroom, and this had been cut to allow for the removal of water and cargo residue. And just uh, there are so many, but I've only picked out three. The Saga Rose was another one, entering a ballast tank where one person died when he went to check the tank contents as to whether it was my memory is correct whether it was fresh water or seawater. So all, how all of this happened was I began to do a series of experiments. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, raising the awareness of the danger of the dangers. Uh, and a series of experiments can help us do that. Uh, 
Oxygen depletion begins immediately after the closure of the space. And this is when you see the graphs, you will understand exactly what I mean by immediately. The speed of this oxygen depletion is extremely alarming. By realizing that an oxygen depleted space looks normal, and you have to realize that most cargoes and spaces absorb oxygen. Uh, Martin mentioned that I was involved with the Sten Association of Maritime Institutes, and we finished my last job there was as secretary was to pull together an enclosed space course in 2015. But when it was over, there was obviously something missing. I couldn't put my finger on it at the time, but I knew there was some sort of experiment was needed just to show how quickly the oxygen uh, can be depleted. And then one morning at half past five in April 2015, I had that eureka moment, woke up quite clear, and basically it was to use an experiment based on Dalton's law of partial pressures. Now, just to, Dalton's law of pressure, is, there's no great big uh, magic about it. It is just simply, when we say that the percentage of oxygen in the air is 20.9, what we really mean is that the partial pressure of the oxygen is 20.9 kilopascals. That's 209 millibar, or well, just over three pounds per square inch. But if each of the 16 elements of the air existed in a closed containment on its own, the pressure it would have would be the partial pressure of the element. And then the sum of all the partial pressures would be the atmospheric pressure. So here's just a simple um, diagram of the five main constituents, oxygen, nitrogen, argon, uh, some moisture and carbon dioxide, giving you the air uh, scenario of, of and, and that's the atmospheric pressure. All the other, the remaining 11 are very, very small, the total put together, 0.175. So if all the oxygen in an enclosed space is absorbed through rusting, the pressure uh, within a, a closed containment will be reduced by 20.9 kilopascals. In other words, you can show a partial vacuum effectively of a, in a closed containment. And I will show, show you how that happens in, in just a moment. The resulting partial vacuum can be readily illustrated using a manometer. And this pressure then can be converted into a percentage oxygen. So here is when I uh, started out with, I built an eight foot high manometer with uh, pressure ratings on it, or um, um, ratings to show you the, the head, of, head of water and converting those into, into, uh, into readings, oxygen readings. So this was the actual keg and it was full of scrap metal. So you had a, it was 25 liters in size and that was packed solid with, with um, uh, uh, scrap metal. And here you can see in the top photograph here, you can see the water level when the full partial vacuum had been, uh, I know that sounds a contradiction, but when the partial pressure had been reached, uh, uh, oxygen had been all uh, de depleted, the water was up there and you can see on the other uh, photograph here, it was right down to the bottom. That coincided with particularly high atmospheric pressure, which um, which does affect the, 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 the experiment. And this is what I used as the initial experiment, all sorts of bits and pieces I had over in, the, in, in, in my little workshop. And then I bought some nails, which would give me a huge amount of surface area. And at the time I had some swarf in there, but I got rid of the swarf because when you would be taking it out to wash it, I had to, first of all, I had to wash it to get rid of the, the oils in it. And then it would go all over the place. So I changed uh, away if I just excluded that. And here gives you some simple idea as to the dangers involved with the different oxygen levels. So the green basically is down to 19.5 where that is the safe area. And then from 19 down to 15 here, you're, you're talking in terms of impaired coordination and decreasing ability to work. But you go from below that down to 14, down to 10, you get this thing called, they call it blue lips and oxygen depra deprivation uh, and, and, uh, and poor judgment. And this is actually similar to what would occur if you go mountain climbing and the percentage oxygen uh, is also reduced there. You do get blue lips and you do make poor judgments uh, up there. Below 10%, you're now into the deep, um, as I would call it, the dire straits area. 
the mental failure, fainting, nausea. I, I, I would suggest to you that after that, your chances of survival are extremely slim. They are bad at, at in 14 and 10. So what I did was I created this manometer uh, and the different manometer readings then of say 92 millimeters of water and you were down to 20% oxygen. 143 and you were down to 19.5 and so on right down to 2131 millimeters which meant that you were basically the all the the oxygen in there had been depleted now again i would say to you look there's the 10 percent level there and below that you're in dire straits and below six my belief is that you are pretty well dead so look what happens when you um the, for, the first set of experiments were the closed containment experiments, and they were at 10 degrees centigrade. Now, it's also important to notice the permeability of the, uh, of the space is about 90% uh, free air space inside or 90% ability of water to enter the space. But I'm more interested in the air content. So you had a lot of air in there compared to the, the surface area. But look at the time it took to reduce to 19.5%, only 1.45 hours. And it's down to 6% in 28 hours. So all of these went down to, to almost zero. But I've just chosen those three as the, as the worrying, as the important points. 19.5, where you shouldn't go in after that. 10 is where you are in dire straits and six, not good. Look what happens when the temperature then increases to 23 degrees. Your time for the um, oxygen to deplete to 19.5% is now 18 minutes. That's 0.3 of an hour. And down to 6%, it's 2.41 hours. But this is frightening. And I can tell you that the very first experiment I did when, when, when I and I thought, I said, I really was trying to figure out, is this going to work in the first place? And it was so frightening that I could not sleep that night. And the reason I couldn't sleep that night was I'd been in those areas long, long time ago. And I never knew anything about the speed of oxygen depletion like this. So this is what the graphs look like. And there is one, what I would describe as probably the most important element of this here. Look at what happens immediately the hatch cover is closed. The two graphs are down immediately, straight there, they're immediately dropping down. So you're 10% you're in blue and you're red at the 23% in that. So it's very, very steep drop. So they, they, they cross the line at 10% at there, that's, that's uh, 1.56 hours. And then the blue one, it is 18 hours. So these are just frightening on average. Now these were, I have quite a few experiments to average out here in this. So then to prove all of this that was actually happening and, and, and that I, I could justify it and whatever, uh, Kevin Slade, who was, uh, he was with, with Stena at uh, the time and then he subsequently became chairman of the Merchant Navy Training Board. And we, we have very, very good friendship. And Kevin sponsored this. And this is a cystic transducer and it is a brilliant little piece of equipment. And I was able to use this, the two experiments at the one time, you can see the, the line going out there to the manometer, and this was reading out as well. So I got the two responses, but sorry, let me just go back to this one here. This I found very, very difficult to empty. As you can see, the neck is quite small. So to empty that, I had to put her up on the, on the bench and then poke all the stuff out with uh, screwdrivers and things like that. And so, I hurt my shoulder at the time, so I had to change. So I changed on to uh, a new pipe style of thing. And this basically is a six inch uh, uh, sewer pipe uh, with connections here. And uh, this is where I was able to connect in the, 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 the transducer into and, and return the, the outlet from that back into it. And you can see here is the connection, the seal and the connection onto the manometer. And it's inside in a thermostatically controlled hot box with two 50 watt bulbs and, 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 um, and a thermostat inside. 
So I was able to read the temperature within it. I had a little thermometer there at the side and I could see when the lights were on and off as the case might be. And that basically is, you can see the setup there where that's coming up and onto this particular manometer here. And these were the ceiling arrangements. They were the original ones. Uh, and I discovered that these were a better scenario here. These were more of a sponge, a hard sponge. And they were available in most pet shops for as throwing rings for dogs. They were absolutely superb for sealing the, 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 the pipe scenario and this is what the two um this is what the two graphs show me that the cystec transducer uh, readout is in blue and the partial pressure my own uh, experiment was in red now they will slightly differ here and you will see down here that they do but that will be because of uh, an atmospheric rise in in, uh, in, in pressure so let me show you what, what actually happens in this, in this setup here, because what I really wanted to do was to create an experiment that would show this actually happening. And I, what I really, all I really wanted to do was to have this experiment sitting in the classroom whilst you were talking to the students so that the students could see the oxygen, the effect of the oxygen depletion using the manometer. But let me show you what actually happens here. And in doing that, this is a manometer here that is now, uh, the vacuum has been created in. This is the time clock here. And over here, you will see the, um, the, 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 the reading as such. <clears throat> and these readings will coincide very, very well. Now, I will show you as they go along. You're now at, at almost coming up to the hour mark here. And I slip in and take a, a reading because I was doing the manometer readings uh, Visually, and as you can see, the the, uh, the readings there uh, they they match quite well. Right, coming up now to nineteen point five, and I'll just stop it there. And you can see for yourself that it's only in one point two eight hours, and the readings are pretty close to to each other. I have a few stills of those that I can show you later on there. But again, you can see it now emerging out of the green. Uh, you can see the it is happening. Now this is a time-lapse photographic uh, scenario where the video is, is takes time-lapse and it's then speeded up. But it shows you, all I wanted to do was to put that in the corner of a classroom, let it work and then sort of say, guys, whilst we're sitting here, look what's happened to the, to the, um, to the, to the containment and the oxygen is now being depleted at this stage. So I'll just run it on for you there so that I don't want to take, spend too much time at it. And you can see it as I move the video forward. Uh, it is going away up. And as you can see there now, it's it's down to 12.7% and it's almost down here to, to that. So the whole purpose was to sh show people how quickly it happened. So then moving on from that was the next step then was to, to do an open vented experiment. And the open vented experiment basically is the same container, except that it do, you do no longer need a seal and you're just using the Systec transducer here. And to, to, to any of you who were around in my time, they're the kind of vents we used to have out of the double bottom tanks and things like that. The gooseneck wooden plug and a canvas cover was in, in, in case of, of weather. Everything is exactly the same. And the time taken will be longer here than it would obviously be in the enclosed container because air can be sucked in when the oxygen is used up. So in this case, you're talking of down to uh, 10 degrees, you're talking of 19.5% is reached in 1.91 hours and 6% in 38, 39 hours. And again, look what happens when you go to 23 degrees. The time is rapidly increased. It's now it's down to 0.84 of an hour and you're down to 6% in eight hours. This is a pure scrap metal cargo. Cargos that have been carried around regularly and if they're loaded wet as, uh, or in raining conditions, and of course we do get a lot of rain in, this, in these climates here. So these are your graph averages. And again, look at the thing, there is no delay. As soon as you close the hatch cover, it, it it starts immediately. And again, 10 at you, you reach 10 in 5.68 hours. 
and in the in the colder climate it's 24 hours so within a day you are down to the possible death conditions now we hear a lot of talk about adjacent spaces and connected spaces and one of the the things i showed you there early one of the one of the cases i showed you was where um uh, ventilation trunking, the, there was a, a cut in the ventilation trunking. Well, I wanted, Kevin Slade suggested one day to me, how could you use this to show adjacent spaces being a problem? So I thought I said, yeah. And uh, anyway, these can, this, 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 uh, leak, any leakage between the cargo spaces can cause a, a depletion in the, in the adjacent space. And this could be cracks or access doors or whatever. And if it's big enough, then depleted air or toxic gases can enter the, the adjacent space. Maybe just at this moment, I just explain, I like to explain things to students in this fashion where you show how things happen. So I like to do it in stages. And if this is the cargo hold here, 21% of it is oxygen. So when all that oxygen is used up, it's replaced by this amount of air, which is exactly the same size. And it has so much oxygen. When all that's used up, it has this amount of air to replace it, and so on and so on as it gets smaller. But it does elongate the time compared to a, a, a completely sealed one. So to illustrate how an adjacent space can, can be affected, made up this pipe here with two, two ends on it. That one is open completely, so it, it's connected. So the, the pipe is connected to another uh, manometer there. And what this end has a, uh, a bit of stud bar in it and then that's connected onto to the main and that's the stud bar so this is a replica end as such and I did this to explain to people just what I was trying to do it's drilled and tapped a bit of stud bar in and then a lock nut so for all intents and purposes it is sealed up but far from it the bar the, the, the stud bar basically has space between the, the threads because if you didn't have space between the threads, you couldn't. There was no clearance, you couldn't put it on. So you have a space there between the threads. And I was able to measure by movement of the bar and then the angles and things like that, that the clearance opening was actually 0.426 of a square millimeter. And for the size of what I had, there was 10 spirals to enable the air to clear the threaded portion. And this basically was the setup I was using. There's my main uh, simulated cargo hold connected to this uh, manometer. And then this uh, little adjacent space device here is connected onto that through this valve here to this particular uh, manometer. So what happens is when I open that valve and I have a partial pressure existing in this one, when I open that valve, the air is sucked through that out of there into this and the pressure in there will increase because there's new air being added and the pressure in there will be will suddenly be at the same pressure as is in here and i'll show you that and it, it takes just a minute before i started but there's the existing uh, simulated cargo hole there with it with the partial vacuum in it i can only show the top end because it's it's another four foot down the bottom and there is this one here, and you can see it's pretty pretty level there at the moment. So when you start, look how quickly the air is drawn out of the adjacent uh, space uh, little model, <clears throat> and the, the pressure inside in the main container drops down. So it just will keep on going. And if you look, this is only 13 minutes. Uh, so it works out that under these circumstances, it's about, it takes about 40 minutes to, to uh, equalize. Now, this doesn't happen this way in real life, but it's only just to demonstrate how easily it is for air to be drawn in through a very, very restricted opening. Something that you say, ah, that, that really doesn't happen, but yes, it does. The smallest opening, you can take air out of the, of the system. Something like 40 minutes, they were, they were equalized. Uh, this would be happening normally on an ongoing basis. Now, if we assume that the hatch cover is airtight, uh, the oxygen level in the adjacent space would be reduced to about 16% because the pressures will be the same. And if the opening is large, then the adjacent space conditions 
would be exactly the same as what is happening in the whole with, with, with legal consequences. And you've seen the, the, the averages there earlier on. Now, moving forward to uh, the, the, the um, no pun intended, to the forward area here, you have a lot of things coming together in this area. And we'll deal with that, deal with that uh, later on. But right now, we're talking about the chain locker. And so consequently, uh, the guys in Ceftec uh, here in Carrigaline, they make fire training units and, and helicopter dunkers. And one of my former students is part of that. And they built this scale model uh, chain locker for me based on the size of uh, the training vessel we used to have, which was about 500 tons. And it's the, the size and the size of the anchor chain is pro rata then 20.35, I think it was. I'll, I'll show you that later on. But this uh, transducer is roughly at the height of where somebody would stand if they were inside in the chain locker, standing on the, the top of it. Now, I have a transparent uh, lid on it, so you can see into it and realize no danger in there. It looks, it looks as though there's no danger in there. And then when you see the graphs, you will realize that it is. And the anchor chain, uh, uh, again, this was just anchor chain to give me surface area, and the surface area again was 20.35 to 1 compared to the original anchor chain that was in the Kilarna. Uh, uh, I got a lot of these from Antico who do uh, maintenance on chain blocks and stuff like that, and then I had to get some new chain and desyncify that new chain to give me sufficient uh, size of chain. Now look, let's look at the uh, First of all, let's look at the permeability of the space here. It's 94% uh, free air space inside. That's huge. <clears throat> but look then at the time taken for the oxygen to deplete to 10 to 19.5%. To, um, to now, this again is at the 10 degrees centigrade. So in 4.53 uh, hours, the oxygen level in the chain locker is down to 19.5. And in six and in 58 hours, it's down to 6%. So within, within just two and a half days, this is, you're, you're in deadly conditions in there. Now, again, when you go to 23 degrees, it's more than, the time is, is, is more than half. Or so. so again, when you see this, there's the, there's the uh, surface area and the, the air to steel ratio is there, 20.35 to 1. These are the graph averages of the chain locker experiments that I did, did quite a few of these. And again, I just keep on harping, immediately you close up the containment, the oxygen level is depleted. So when it comes to 10%, you're there at, at, at uh, in the warmer conditions, you're 17, uh, 17 hours, and when it's 23, you're 38 hours. So these are absolutely and utterly frightening. And both of these cases, um, they went down to 1% uh, oxygen. So frightening. Now, this is refreshment of chain locker. I was able to, to do that. And, and um, I was able to remove the lid and then seemingly uh, replace it with another cover, which had an opening uh, that would be, be prorata to what was there and what it do, what this does is it gives an indication of the dangers of premature entry and again this would have been the case with uh, the Viking Isle I presume that once you open the door and you go in well this is this is really really dangerous so there was the natural refreshment of the thing I opened uh, I disconnected one, slip, moved one off and moved the other one seamlessly across. And then this opening here is the actual opening size of the, the one on the Killarna. And the air then went in and displaced the, the, uh, the stale air inside. Now, I'm going to be a small bit careful here. I'm not going to give you actually details, but I'll give you close enough. <clears throat> but the first thing I have to tell you is that this is specific to just one vessel because that's about the only one that I could lay my hands on that I knew what I was doing. And the time to refresh there will, will vary and it will depend on the ambient temperature, but it can take up to four hours 
to refresh to 19.5%. Now, if you go in before that, you are without question in danger unless you're ventilated and, and tested. Now, if the access to this door is through another space, then of course the time taken can be elongated. In addition, the door position is assumed to be at the top. And if the door on the, is on the side, natural refreshment will only uh, occur up to the top of the door. So I just want to point out to you that immediate entry will be fatal. Now moving on a little bit to the last piece of the of what I want to talk about today is uh, ballast tanks. So you're talking about double bottom tanks here. And I want to pose you just a couple of little scenarios here. In the old days, the, uh, in my time, the double bottom tank entry point used to be roughly at A and B, as the case might be. But now if you have pipe tunnels and things like that, you could come in the side here at maybe C or D. You could also maybe on, on, on wing tank access as well. But I want you to consider person at X or Y, as the case might be. Uh, th these are the people that you... These are the spaces where if people go in, it's going to be difficult ex uh, extraction or extrication, whichever way you wish to put it. And there's your, your wing tank access there. And they're, they're quite, quite small, whatever. So again, this is part of this is in another paper. So these elements here are not. <clears throat> so I did a whole series of experiments, but I'm only going to discuss just two of them. <clears throat> because three others are in another paper that is should be is on the peer review at the moment. Now, these are 42% bare steel and 30.47 bare steel. Now, this was a, a tank that made up uh, the guys in City of Glasgow College who I work with on, on this to take it forward. And they made up this double bottom tank for me here with eight plates, eight steel plates, and these intermesh just like the the the, the dividers in a, in a in a wine box or something like that. <clears throat> and where I got the idea of this originally was from Clyde Severe in, in Belfast, Graham Knowles. And Graham showed me the, um, the, the, the method that they classify um, the breakdown, coating breakdown. And I thought, oh, wow, that's a, a, a good way of deciding this. So I said, here, with this, what you are looking at there at the moment would be 48% bare steel compared to the, the lid and the sides and the, the whole the whole surface areas. And then by replacing one of these steel uh, plates with a plastic one of exactly the similar size and openings and cuts and everything in it, that would reduce it down to 42%. And by reducing it further to 36 and to 30 and 24, so you can have a mix of plates to give you uh, a good cross-section of, of um, where, um, uh, bare steel areas. So there basically is your same, your tank with uh, vent. This is the, the uh, open vented scenario again, which is there. And uh, the, the uh, transducer there as such. And what I came across here was, and again, it's exactly the same scenario that I'm trying to get across, is that as soon as you close it up, the oxygen level begins to deplete. And with 42% bare steel, you're down to 19.5%. That's, oh, that's a lot of bare steel. And if, I'm sure surveyors will be laughing and saying, well, that ship wouldn't be going to sea. But it's down to 19.5% in 2.34 hours and 13% in 126, 27 hours, as the case might be. And then you can see the difference straight away where you reduce down to 5 uh, um, to 30% 30, 30 bare steel. The time has elongated, and the time will keep elongating as the percentages go down. So, what I was able to do then was to make predictions from, well, these two. Let's let's stick with these two. Uh, I was able to make predictions from those as to what would be, you would happen at 18, 12, 6, 3 percent bare steel, and at 3 percent it would take you down to 13 percent in 265 hours. So. Just picking those two, there's your basic, there's your two basic graphs. And they're quite, quite similar. The 42% uh, the bare steel is obviously quicker 
than the than the the um, thirty percent one, and you can see there it reaches thirteen percent in a shorter time, one than thirty five hours, and this one is one than no, well, it's showing the same thing, but there as you can see there now, one is about one than twenty, just on the one than thirty, and the other one than forty. Now you can do graphs then on that. These are the two concerned, and I was able to show on this particular graph now with this oxygen percentages along the bottom and the hours vertically. You can see there with 3% your, your, your graph, you can get a good idea as to what is actually happening. And remember, these can be continued on down to zero if you feel like it. Just to wrap up, I think this is probably a very, very good uh, photograph. And it shows the inside of the double bottom tank, the cover still in place. And there's the rusted area. It looks normal, but it is lethal. So anybody who would do a risk assessment and say, oh yeah, it looks okay. Well, then you really have a problem, but it looks normal, but of course it is lethal. So just to, to, to sum up, um, as soon as the hatch cover or the tank is closed, the oxygen level begins to deplete, uh, deplete immediately, and a space may look normal, even though depleted of oxygen. So the rest is how I would talk to students, treat all enclosed spaces as unsafe. All bare steel, scrap metal, cargoes, chain lockers absorb oxygen. And you should treat all adjacent spaces as suspect areas for oxygen depletion. Thank you. And I would ask you to stay around. Um, Donald, thanks very much for that. Um, just a reminder to everybody, if you want to, to add some questions on to Slido. Um, uh, also worth mentioning, Donald, uh, Donald mentioned his, uh, his paper. Uh, that paper is available within IMRS already um, to, in, in GMET, in inverted commas. Um, and uh, another, another paper is, is in the pipeline, if that's not a, a bad pun. Um, let me let me sort of pick up a couple of a couple of points um, about this the, the work that I that the human element industry group uh, is doing at the moment. One of the things that we're considering is uh, connected and adjacent species, um, and there are a number of um, uh, a number of cases where um, holds uh, which are containing oxygen depleting cargos are connected to a, a, a working space um, and um, a number of deaths have occurred um, in those cases. So I guess, you know, the, the thing for me is, is um, connected spaces, um, anything that has even got the slightest possibility of, of there being a, a, a channel through to it um, should be just treated the same way as an, an enclosed space. Would that, would that be the case? Yes, that, that, that is absolutely true. The slightest... The reason I made that that uh, little stud bar going through the the end plate there was to illustrate just how such a small little little space can actually permit the air to to be drawn through. <clears throat> so any anywhere that you have either a leaking door, for example, and you did send me some a, a lovely photograph there of 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 one one of the doors that was very rusted and things like that. But I had so much stuff I I didn't particularly use that. But um, anywhere that the slightest that the door is not sealed, there's a leakage, real, you're in real trouble. I guess the way I would look at it and, and, and the way that we're thinking about it from the point of view of, um, of changing regulations um, is that anything that has any, any connection path between a hold and, um, and a space should be treated the same way as the hold. Yeah. Um, and so the, you know, there is a likelihood that, that 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 space will be oxygen deficient, and and when it gets to adjacent spaces, we're we're really relying on there being some sort of a failure of the watertight or gas tight integrity between the two the two spaces, which could be as 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 trivial as being a nut that's not fully tightened or or anything like that. Yeah, the the other scenario there was, and again, it was something you had sent to me was the Australian uh, lathers. Uh, frightening, frightening aspect. I, I have never come across those, but uh, equally uh, in log carriers, there's the same problem with stairwells. 
the stairwells go all the way down to the bottom as such and of course there are no there are openings between the stairwell and the cargo hold which are not sealed so the stairwells there are exactly the same conditions as prevail within the the cargo holds as such but that's that's for another day I've, I've been doing some other work on that what is would you say 23 degrees is, is a sort of typical temperature for an enclosed space and board ship and I, i'll explain to you why why those temperatures they, they just happen to be the temp the, the 10 degrees happen to be the temperature that i was in my garage at the time but it also works out to be uh roughly about the average sea temperature around Ireland and the UK. In fact, it's the, 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 um, the annual average temperature is 11 degrees uh, C uh, in the UK and Ireland. And the 23 would be uh, off the coast of, uh, of Africa and Las Palmas between Las Palmas and, and, and Gibraltar during the summertime. So they're, they're relevant places to be. And, Put it this way, you could keep on, on doing experiments for years on different temperatures, but you really won't prove anything. Those two extremes, uh, are, uh, two norms, I should say, of 10, 11 and uh, 23 are a good enough example to say, OK, if it's, if, if it's so much at, at 10 or 11 degrees and it's so much at 23 degrees and you know the local temperature, well, you'll be somewhere between the, the, the two of those. Am I, am I right in saying that there are that some of the cargoes that we're talking about generate their own heat as well? That, that would be a case. Um, I deliberately didn't get into that because I didn't want any possibility of, of a fire occurring within my house, my home. <laughs> 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 yeah. And you can imagine trying to explain that to the insurance assessors. <clears throat> but but, but, but um, yes, that would be the case. So that's that was why I stayed, steered away very much from from a uh, 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 swarf for such. You, you, you mentioned that, um, I'm, 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 I'm feeding in some of the questions that, that I've got in front of me here. Um, you, you mentioned uh, you could carry on doing a lot of experiments um, about this. Are you aware of anyone having done this experimental work before? Because I'm, oh, I'm not conscious of it, of it particularly. That, that, that really bothered me because I was, at that stage, I was 73, you remember, 2015, I was 73. I, I was searching the internet and, and wherever I could find, and I could get no, no one to, no, no, no answer whatsoever as to how quickly oxygen depleted. It was just, just, I searched everywhere. No, perhaps there are, but I certainly couldn't find it. And the guys I worked with in Glasgow and, and Kevin Slade as well, none of us could find any reference to the speed of oxygen depletion. And I think if you if you look at it logically, um, every time that there is a, a, an inquest or, or a, <clears throat> a coroner is adjudicating on stuff, that all they will be able to tell you is the conditions within the hold or the, the, the blood sample tells you that there was so much carbon dioxide or, or that the oxygen level. But there's no, no, to me, I couldn't find anything. Now, perhaps there are, but I, I couldn't find it. No, I mean, I, I certainly haven't seen anything myself, and it, it is quite frightening that research hasn't actually, actually been done. Well, but the, the, the experiments that I was doing there, it, was ba it, it, it all started out basically with oxygen depletion, and with the cystic transducer, uh, this was taking a, a reading every single minute. So there's a very, very good, I have a very good record of, of everything that happened and the curves and the graphs, so they're very, very, very accurate. The um, lost the plot there for a second. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have that effect. Yes, yes. Sir. <laughs> no, no, no. This is my problem, not 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 yours. Um, it, 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 in in terms of um, scalability, in terms of of how you you know you did the the, the sort of experiment on your on your um, on your training ship. In terms of scalability, how do you feel the if you did a, a full test um, on a you know the, the hold of a hold of a ship or a chain locker of a larger vessel or something like that? How do you think the the results would change? Would they? I don't think they will change very much. Uh, remember now, there there are a few scenarios. You just you mentioned the chain locker. Well, 
the chain, most chain lockers when they go to sea nowadays, they seem to close up the swirling pipe as well with, with foam to stop water ingress and things like that. So in reality, it becomes an enclosed space completely. Uh, and events there are can be can be secured, closed off, whatever. So, uh, but the way I've done it is I have the permeability of each space and each cargo. So from that, you will get a pretty good idea that, in fact, it may be even more severe than the figures that I am getting. If the permeability is, uh, is, um, is lower, uh, this means that there's less air in there. So based on the permeability of the, of the space, the, in other words, the available amount of air, I would say that would be pretty well the same with a full cargo. You know, it does lend itself to being to being uh, tested uh, on board ship, and we had been looking at that. Kevin Slade and the guys in Glasgow, we had I had a pretty good idea of, of how I could could do that. But it's not every place on a ship you you really can't do this on a cargo hold of a ship because the the sensors will be damaged, the sensors would be uh, covered in in dust, or, or or indeed if you had to wash down the the the, the hold, which you would do have to do after after some cargoes, uh, the 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 uh, transducer or the the sensor uh, could be destroyed by by water. So there is only certain areas you could do it. But up up forward in the in the junctions of the chain locker and the uh, forecastle and cargo entry spaces are indeed um, stairwells. Yeah, these could be these could be constant reading scenarios, but they're not cheap. You know that 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 little sensor that you're talking about there was two and a half thousand. Right. So, and 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 remember, I was looking after that with great care. Whereas on a ship, you got to be careful that you that you um you treat this stuff very very carefully. I, I guess you could do a sort of um, a sort of comparison um, with spaces that were easy to work on and. and you know, build up the sort of dimensional analysis, says he, pretending he remembers his naval architecture from college. <laughs> you, you, I seem to remember you gave me B minus the last time we spoke about my knowledge of Dalton's law of fa partial pressures. But anyway, <laughs> um, um, mo moving on, uh, you, you've had a look at the, you've had a look at the. Um, I'm a, a, IMO's um, entry into enclosed space regulations. What 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 is your thoughts about those, and what what do you think we could change on those? Well, there was one particular instance, and I, I really hadn't intended discussing it today, in the sense that it was more appropriate to uh, carbon dioxide levels, but it did frighten me, and I don't know the status of this particular document, but it mentioned that at one stage. Um, that when the oxygen level drops to 19.5%, that uh, this carbon dioxide level was 7%, which I have sort of, I can't, uh, I can't find that happening because I've done a huge amount of work now on organic cargoes as well. Uh, there was so, so much today that they just couldn't physically fit everything in. Um, but the, what the IMO, and I mean, I, please forgive me now for, for making the assumption that my, my stuff is 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 absolutely gospel. I um, mean, the, the first this paper that you're looking at has been peer reviewed, and they 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 will, will accept that. But um, I have clearly demonstrated through my experiments that the oxygen depletion begins immediately, and the speed of it is frightening. So I I I, I would hope this this was always a fervent desire of mine that it might affect. Uh, the the IMO uh, somewhere along the line, and get them to publish the fact that the speed of oxygen depletion is absolutely frightening. That that's really what I would like to to see happen. Would you would you like to see IMO bring in a sort of standard of training for enclosed space entry under under ST, STCW? Absolutely. Um, I think I think there is no no doubt whatsoever that this is needed now. I know there are a lot of companies, and this is what Stena were doing: is that they were they were uh, creating this course, for so that all the colleges uh, would have the same same course. And 
I'm not sure what has happened there as such, but yes, there should be without question. Um, the, the, the other thing is, and I'm, uh, what I really, all I really wanted to do was to create that experiment that you could sit in the corner of a classroom and watch the oxygen level uh, uh, deplete as such. Uh, but in, re in realistic terms, it's not everyone would have the interest to do and create an experiment every time a course is run. So a video would be a, a far better mm. scenario. Something like the video I showed there, except that was time lapse. But to me, that kind of a video running continuously was the course is in action and the, the lecturer could refer to, to, um, to it and sort of say, guys, why have we been sitting here? Look what's happened. Um, just, a, just, a, just a question that I've, I've seen on the screen. Um, uh, the the um, person asking the question is, um, I'll read it out, maybe that's the best way, rather than me reinterpreting it. It would be good if you could clarify if you're suggesting that only oxygen is being deleted from adjacent spaces or if there's just a pressure reduction of air. I think what they're saying is, um, are you inferring the, the oxygen redu reduction just from the Dalton's law of par partial pressures or are you measuring oxygen content? No, I'm inferring that that the uh, if the, if the air pressure within the adjacent space is reduced. Let's assume now it's a, it's a, a closed area as well. <clears throat> All that's happened in there is the air pressure will have been uh, reduced and the oxygen equivalent level then in that reduced air works out about 16% if all of the oxygen in the hold is, 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 is done. Exactly the same will be happening as you climb mountains, as I mentioned earlier. The oxygen level at high altitudes is much lower and and so it's the same it's the same effect, basically. Yeah, I, I do remember that I was in Peru a few years ago, and um, as you got higher up the mountain, it got a little bit more difficult. Um, probably shouldn't say this, but they, they encourage you to chew coca leaves to, <laughs> to, to aid, 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 aid the oxygen. Apparently, opens up the the, the, the capillaries and all the rest of that. Right, uh, Martin. I'm, let's I'm, let's not go there. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not encouraging this. You know, I'm not this. suggesting that you'd use that going into a, a an indoor <laughs> space. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, no. let's, let's just be a little bit careful. You know, we, we, had a, we had a great trip to Peru. I just don't remember anything about it. <laughs> no, I, I, I can I explain to you there how I know about the blue lips. Is there was a, a lady here one day. She was measuring up for a, a new garage door that I had, and I, she was looking at the equipment, and she, um, she said, "Well, what's all this about?" And I explained it to her, and she says, "Oh, same thing happens as you go up mountains." So I said, "Oh, and have you ever had blue lips?" And she said, "Oh, yeah." So she was down at that stage, down close to 10% oxygen level climbing the mountain. And apparently it affects all sorts of people differently in the sense that some people can be violently ill at, 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 at low uh, oxygen levels, whereas others can, can, can manage it. So it's, uh, it's difficult to generalize as such. So I, I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming sort of towards the end and there's three questions that which I've been holding back on because they're, they're about, about you know, the future. Um, and one of the questions that somebody has asked is um, whether, uh, on, on the basis of the work that you've done, whether forced ventilation of cargo spaces should be introduced or, or alternatively O2 readouts um, at, at, um, at entry points. Well, forced ventilation would be extremely good. If you recall back in the old days, the number of ventilators that were on the deck that would take in the air and, and uh, you feed in at the front end and or the other way around, whichever the case might be, and at the back end, yeah, they were, they were good, but mostly used for coal cargoes, things like that. Ideally good, but look, if you have to live with a the situation, then the moral of the story is to raise the awareness. And, uh, and if you raise the awareness that you don't go in there, like for example, you were, you were a, a, a tanker man as such, you never went into a cargo tank. You never went into a cargo tank simply because you knew there was danger in there. But the problem here with the dry cargoes is there's, you don't see any danger. Like the chain lockers, ah, it looks okay. And you don't see the danger. Whereas this is, this is the problem in, in getting across to people. And that's why I was hoping that this, this, this experiment would show uh, that, there, that there is no oxygen in there. So 
Well, you did ask another question. Sorry, Mark, another part of that question. Uh, um, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, ongoing uh, equipment. Yeah, that. Do, do you recall? Uh, no, you, I know you were on tankers, but we used to have on the dry cargo ships, we used to have a, a kitty uh, detection system, smoke detection system. And it, it was basically, it was a pipe leading from each cargo space up to the bridge. Uh, and they passed through uh, glass tubes in the bridge and you could see the smoke. And if there was a smoke, the, the alarms would go off. Or so if you had something like that, but then again, you need to have an oxygen uh, 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 detector on each of the uh, uh, of, of the, the um, pipes as such. Um, so I, I don't really don't think it's feasible. I think the most important one is that we raise the awareness and the where you can have uh, uh, detection that that would be an extremely good idea, such as in the the for the the Foxal area. Uh, I think you could do, and, and I certainly I had done some work on that previously with with uh, Kevin uh, Slade in Glasgow, and we had a pretty good idea what we were going to do. Um, I, I get a, sim a similar question. Uh, any anything that your experiments tell you? Um, that should lead to changes in the structure of ships, um, how to restructure ships, how to, you know, in, in building of new ships and all the rest of that, any, any sort of things that jumps out and hits you? Not, not, not specifically, not specifically from this, because the oxygen depletion seems to be, um, I'm not sure of the word I'm going to use now, but basically it's evenly spread throughout the, 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 um, the the atmosphere, whereas in organic cargos, the the um, the carbon dioxide does drop to the bottom, uh, and that's that will that's for another day. But I have done some good work on that, and I've been able to figure out the carbon dioxide level at the bottom of the hold as well as at the top of the hold, uh, and by by direct readings, and uh, huge. Now, I have seen on some ships where they use gas as the uh, the cooking. In, in smaller ships where they use LPG, that they had uh, suctions from the base, from the floor level of the, um, just in case there was any gas escaped and they would just simply pipe it outside to the at atmosphere, just an extraction fan effectively. So there is a possibility of something like that, but again, uh, that, it's more for the carbon dioxide. It really, I don't think it would have any great effect other than by thorough ventilation of the whole space. Um, and final question, which is a nice open one. Uh, what would you like to see done in the industry as a result of your research? I know you've given us some ideas, but this is your opportunity to, to round it up and, and, um, and, and give us a, a list. Well, look, what I was hoping would happen from today is that people would, and I suppose, look, I have the information, you have the information, the Institute now has the information, but it's up for every single one of us to pass this information on to the students, to the, to the so anybody in the shipping industry who is, who is watching today, please tell the, the ship staff of the dangers. That, that, that to me would be the most important outcome. Look, I've had a, an extremely good life. I've been involved in, since I was 16, I've been involved in, in maritime education but as of now i'm just trying to give something back and hopefully this will 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 make a difference okay well look thanks thanks very much um for that donald um i i think you, have, you absolutely have given something back i found this our discussions over the last few months have been quite have been quite fascinating um and um i just think it does you it does you great credit that you've you've put your you know, put the, your time in your retirement to 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 such um to such good use and used all the knowledge and experience that you've gained. I, I believe that the information that you've given us um, today is probably going to make a difference in ter in terms of things like connected and adjacent spaces. I, I believe it'll help people to understand chain lockers and the and the risks um, associated with them. Um, and I, I would just just like to say thank you very much for the uh, for the time that you've spent here today. And I, I probably didn't mention it in the in the beginning, but but also I, I, I believe your 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 first paper won an award in Scotland. Is that right? Yeah, it was. It received research project of the year, which is sponsored by the trip. Oh Lord, 
the Herald in the Herald, in, yeah. in, in Scotland. Um, well, we were delighted with that, but hmm. like what it does is it's just another avenue that we can spread the message of the, 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 you know, it, the, the sorry, it, that was put in by the, the college in Glasgow and I must say, but absolutely great um, uh, work with them. And uh, so, so we're, we're, I'm very pleased with the association with, with Glasgow.